<laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's so good to see you here this afternoon. It's always difficult to get folk to come out um, on a Saturday afternoon, this time of the day. A lot of people are wanting to watch the rugby and all sorts of other things, but fortunately, rugby is just about over for this year, isn't it? Um, we are delighted that you have come out. Uh, a lot of you I know, not by name necessarily, but it's good to see some different faces as well. And uh, we are really looking forward to this opportunity. You know, we are so bombarded on all sides by secularism, by evolution, uh, by atheism. And particularly for our young people, it's important to know that they can trust the Bible and that there is good scientific evidence. We don't put aside our scientific minds when we are reading the Bible. And it's good to know that there are good scientists who have done a lot of research, who've, who are well known in the world, who support a biblical perspective. And so um, Peter LaRue is going to come and share some insights with us, lots of insights, and we're going to ask him some difficult questions. So please don't be hesitant to ask him difficult questions. He's had lots of experience in doing that. Um, I first came across CMI in 2007. We were visiting um, Cheryl's family in the UK, in a tiny little town in the middle of England. And we went to church the one day, and on the entrance uh, table, I saw this magazine that I'd never seen before called Creation. 
And I asked them, this looked really attractive. I said, well, what's this all about? They said, no, take it. If you, you can have it if you want to. So I read that, and then I discovered that there's actually a South African chapter of CMI. And ever since, we've been communicating, getting information, sharing information with others. So I'm delighted with the information that CMI produces. And uh, I'm glad that we can share this at this church and in this community today. Uh, before we begin, can I just share, can we just bow our heads as we pray? Father in heaven, all around us we see evidences of your greatness, of your majesty, of your intelligence, of your love, of your love of beauty and design. <clears throat> and Lord, we know that this cannot just happen spontaneously by accident. And so we want to be able to um, understand that what we believe is also supported by good science. We pray that as we spend this time today that you will open our minds and our eyes and our ears to be able to see and hear what you have to say to us so that we can have a reason for the faith that we have in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here, and it's also a privilege for us today to come and minister to you from God's Word concerning this topic of origins. Now, every time I do this talk, I always think back to this little girl. She went to her mother one day, and she asked her mother, Mom, where do humans really come from? And her mother said, My child, it is very easy to explain. If you read in the book of Genesis, it says, In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and that's where everybody comes from. And quite happy, the little girl left and she went straight to her dad. She asked her dad the same question. Dad, where do people come from? The father said, my child, it's actually very easy to explain. If you have uh, uh, listened to what the world's leading scientists have discovered up to now, it's pretty clear we come from the apes and the monkeys and over millions of years of biological evolution, we've actually changed into human beings. Now, when the little girl heard that, immediately she ran back to her mother there in the kitchen and she said, mom, I don't understand. Why is it that when I ask you concerning the origin of humans, you say we go back to Adam and Eve, but dad says we, we come from the apes and the monkeys. And again, a mother looked at her and she smiled and she said, my child, again, very easy to explain. You have to remember, I was referring to my side of the family and your dad was referring to his side. <laughs> That's just <laughs> to start the, the afternoon off on a lighter note. But hopefully you can also see the seriousness in that joke. And it is that people have questions concerning the topic of origins. They've got questions concerning what the Bible teaches us, how this universe got formed, what the world has to say about it, how science and the Bible meet up in the middle. So hopefully by the end of today's talk, you'll have a better understanding concerning the topic of origins. And hopefully you will also see that there's a definite connection between the book of Genesis and the gospel message. And that the gospel message already starts in the book of Genesis. Now, I've spoken to a lot of specifically Christians over the last 24 years concerning this debate that's going on between, you know, was it the literal six-day creation account or millions of years of evolution that occurred? And usually most of those Christians tell me, look, Peter, this is really not such an important topic for us as Christians on how everything, you know, came into existence. It's like a side issue in our faith. What's important for Christians, is Jesus Christ. Just focus on Jesus, put your faith and your trust in Jesus. That's the most important part. Now, we don't have a problem with that. You know, we want people to put their faith and trust in Jesus. But we want people to trust in Jesus because God's word is speaking the truth. Literally, from the very first verse in the Bible. So I'm quickly going to show you what is currently happening in America among the Christian youth. And as we always say, you know, what's happening or going on in America today, tomorrow, we will be there as well. Now, this is a research study that was done for the first time more than 20 years ago by a group called George Barna Research. Since then, quite frequently, they've repeated this study. Every time, they got basically exactly the same results. They discovered that up to 70% of Christian children brought up in a Christian home and in the church will walk away from their faith after they leave home. So you see, that is 70% of children who's been putting their faith and trust in Jesus their entire lives. Then they go out of their parents' homes into the world, and then they turn their back on Jesus. 
They stopped reading the Bible. They didn't even go to church anymore. So these guys said, wow, what is going on in America? Let's do a bit of further research to see if we can discover what's like the main reason for what's going on there. And can you guess what they discovered is currently the number one reason for this phenomenon in America? It's because the children in those American schools are being taught evolution. So to the school children, it sounds like as if science has disproven the Bible at the very first chapter. And, you know, and then the kids think to themselves, wow, if we can't trust the first chapter in the Bible as speaking the truth, where can we start to trust the Bible? Can you trust the Bible further on concerning what it has to say there? And currently, ladies and gentlemen, it is literally an epidemic in America. How those children are specifically turning into atheists. You see, in America, they've been taught evolution for more than 60 years already in those American schools. That's basically like three generations that have passed through that education system. Here in South Africa, we are currently busy with our first generation. It is now exactly 15 years since evolution has been introduced into the grade 12 biology curriculum. So if we want to prevent that, our kids will go down the same road as those American youth. It's time for us to do something about it and get equipped concerning this topic of origins. And then also, I just quickly want to stand still when it comes to the word evolution, because it's a word that's got different meanings. Basically, at its core, evolution means change or change over time that's happening. Now, our organization do not have a problem with change occurring in nature because we can observe change happening out there. But the kind of change that's currently happening out there, it's not evolution that's, happening, that's going on. So what do I mean by that? The world tells us there's two kinds of evolution, two kinds of change happening out there in the world. Now, we don't have a problem with the first kind. It's known as change within a kind. The kids know it as microevolution. It's, for instance, where you start to breed with a parent population of butterflies. They're at the bottom over the years, a lot of offspring that's being produced. And at the end, they're at the top. We end with two daughter populations. And quite clearly, change occurred. I mean, there's change in coloration that occurred. Maybe change in body shape that occurred, or body size. But the key here is we started with a butterfly and we ended with butterflies. So it's still the same kind of a creature, not species. That's a man-made term. And this is exactly what we expect to find in nature because that's what the Bible teaches us ten times in Genesis chapter 1. Ten times it says that God created the organisms according to their kinds, to reproduce according to their kinds. So we would expect that dogs give you dogs, cats give you cats, and kangaroos give you kangaroos. So no problem there. The thing is that the world comes specifically to our children, and then it, it teaches our kids that if you take that kind of change and you give it just enough time, just give it millions of years, you can change one kind into another kind. And it is what's referred to as macroevolution. And this is what our kids are currently being taught today in school, that all life on earth go back there at the bottom to a simple celled organism that lived millions of years ago. And over these alleged millions of years, one kind changed into another kind, from simple to more and more complex creatures. And that kind of change we are totally against because we've never actually observed in nature how one kind is changing into another kind. But unfortunately, this is the only thing our children and grandchildren are currently being taught at school. And not only that, then they go off to university, same story. And then they get home in the afternoons, and it's the turn of the secular media. You know, organizations like National Geographic, for instance, very pro-evolution. Radio stations, like Radio Sonder Geloof, very pro-evolution. Newspapers, movies, you know, it's always just the one side of the story where being exposed to. And our children are thinking that, you know, we're actually nothing special. We're just highly evolved animals, highly evolved apes. But you know what is the key message that gets stuck with children? The Bible isn't true. You can't trust the Bible. The Bible has already been disproven a long time ago. The Bible is full of lies. You see, children do not realize that there is actually an alternative to the theory of evolution. And it is called biblical creation. But unfortunately, not a lot of people are currently being exposed to this kind of information. So that's where our organization fits into the picture. Creation Ministries International is a faith-funded nonprofit organization. We currently have seven offices in seven different countries. 
and primarily we're an information ministry. So we produce information to help people to defend the authority and the accuracy of scriptures from the very first verse. And we get that information out into various resources we produce, like books for adults, children books, DVDs. I brought a couple along there at the foyer. So the deal with our resources is really that people will get a hold of it for themselves and equip themselves with answers, you know, specifically parents. Because just think, if parents are equipped concerning this topic, they can go and in turn go and equip their children, later on their grandchildren, and show them what's written in the Bible is the truth and we can trust it. And that's actually what the Bible commands us to do in 1 Peter 3 verse 15. It says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, one of our main resources, of course, is our website. Very easy web address. It is just called creation.com. And on that website, you will find more than 45 years of creation information. That's how long the ministry has been going. So all you need to do is you go to the top right corner there. You can see there's a search engine. And then there you just type in the question you've always wondered about, always wanted an answer. You know, something like, where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Where did Cain get a wife? Where do all the different races come from? How do these radiometric dating methods really work? Anything you can think of. Just type it in there, and then you will see there are more than 14,000 articles that our people have written over the past 45 years. And those articles are all for free. So you can go and read it, download it onto your computer, even forward it to your friends and family. And in such a way, use our website as a resource to reach the people out there a bit better with the gospel message. Another method we have to get answers out to people is via our electronic newsletter. Now, we call our newsletter an infobite. And the idea with the infobite is really to keep people up to date with the latest claims made by the evolutionists every day in the secular media. For instance, if they dig up another ape man one of these days somewhere here in Africa, within a couple of days, our guys will come together and write the easy-to-understand article from a biblical scientific perspective so that you can make sense of those kinds of evidences. And I can maybe just quickly mention, we currently have 10 PhD scientists that's working full-time for us doing this research and helping to write these articles. So if you are sitting here this afternoon thinking, man, maybe I should get a free email like that from time to time, I've got some good news for you because we are going to give you an opportunity now to subscribe. We are going to circulate little forms. They look like this. And if you want the email, just fill in your name and surname, postal code and email address, and then we will put you on our list. Now, I promise you, we are not going to flood your inbox with emails. It's like maximum two a month that we will send out. And at the end of each email, there is the opportunity. If you don't want to receive it anymore, you can just unsubscribe. So if I can get two people, I don't know if they've organized, just two people to, to um, circulate the clipboards. It's like a collection plate. They're going to hand it out. Just send it down the rows and towards the back. They will have to collect it again because we will need to use it again at the end of the talk. So while you are going to fill it in, there is a pen on the clipboard. So while you are going to fill it in, I'll just carry on with the talk to save a bit of time this afternoon. All right, so when it gets down to the topic of origins, and we first start with the Bible. So we only read Genesis 1. We literally read it like a child. We believe it like a child. We don't listen to what the world has to say about millions of years and ape men and stuff like that. You know, only the Bible. Then the Word tells us that God created everything out of nothing by just speaking everything into being. And he decided to do it within six literal 24-hour days. So, you know, that's the big picture we get there in Genesis 1. But if that is true, then it means on day six, those dinosaurs were created together with Adam and Eve. And that dinosaurs walked in the Garden of Eden. So that's what the Bible has to say about it. If we have a look at what the world has to say concerning this topic of origins, it's totally a different picture. Then it's these millions of years of evolution where one kind supposedly changed into another kind from simple to more and more complex creatures so right from the start you can see there's a clear definite contradiction between what the word teaches us how this universe came into existence and what the world has to say about it now seeing that i believe you're all familiar with what it says in genesis 1 i'm first going to start off with science today then we're going to come back to what the Bible has to say about this topic. We are going to compare the two with each other. And then at the end of this presentation, if there's maybe a couple of questions, I'll be more than welcome to try and give you a proper answer to those questions. Right, so if we have a look at science, what do I mean by science? 
Now, the dictionary actually gives us a very simple definition of what real science is. It is knowledge that's acquired through making observations and doing experiments. It is that simple. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there are limitations to real science. Proper science can only be done in the present because you can only make an observation in the present. You can only set up an experiment in the present. You see, we cannot go back into the past to go and observe what happened there. Yeah, you know, we can't go back even to yesterday to go and set up an experiment there. Do right. you agree? Right. This kind of science, we refer to it as experimental science. This is what I studied for six years of my life at the University of the Free State. Back in the days, I went to study zoology. I acquired a master's degree in zoology. After that, I became a high school life science teacher, and I taught children how to do this kind of science, how to make your observation, how to set up your experiment, how to repeat your experiment, how to set up controls, etc. So our organization, ladies and gentlemen, we're not against science. We love science. This kind of science that you can do in the present. Because the problem is there's another kind of science that's also doing the rounds out there today that specifically our children are being exposed to. And it is what we refer to as historical science. Now, it's a kind of like a forensic science because it's when you look at evidence in the present, for instance, fossils, for example, and then you try to figure out, I wonder what happened there in the past to lead to what I have now here with me in the present. Now, quick question concerning fossils, and please shout out the answer if you have the answer. Who can tell me, where do fossils exist? In the past or in the present? Past, present, confusion. All right. Let me, let me ask the question a bit differently and see if the reaction is maybe a bit differently. Now, I brought a real fossil along with me today. Can everybody see this fossil? Right. This specific fossil that I'm holding here in my hand, where do we find this fossil? In the past or in the present? Now, everybody's saying present. Can you see how you've already been indoctrinated by the world to think that fossils exist in the past? The creature lived in the past. It died in the past. It got fossilized in the past. But today we sit with a fossil in the present. All fossils on earth exist in the present. All evidence on earth exists in the present. You see, we don't have the past. Only history can tell us what happened in the past. But the moment people come up with all these stories and ideas of what they think happened in the past, they're invoking their belief system. What they believe happened there. You know, concerning things they never observed. And we basically sit today with exactly the same situation in court cases. You know, in any court case, there's always two sides to that story. That guy is either guilty or innocent. And those two legal teams come with basically exactly the same evidence to the courtroom, you know, which they collected there from the crime scene. But they come with different stories, different interpretations about what they believe happened there in the past. And at the end of the day, the judge has to decide whose story, whose interpretation best fits with the evidence. And that's not literally what you are going to do this afternoon. Today, you are the judge. You know, your whole life you've been exposed to what the evolutionists have to say concerning origins. Today, we have a couple of minutes or like an hour, maybe two, to give you information through what we think happened in the past. And then at the end of the day, you have to decide for yourself which interpretation best fits with the evidence. Right, so up to now, hope you've already learned a couple of new things this afternoon. Now, we are going to use that now to look at an example that the world shows us quite frequently to try and convince us that this world is millions and billions of years old. And that is, of course, something like the Grand Canyon in America. Now, when we look at something like the Grand Canyon, the first thing that should come to mind is, oh, hang on, Nobody was there in the past to see how that canyon eroded away, how it was formed. Do you agree? Nobody was there. In other words, how the Grand Canyon formed, ladies and gentlemen, has to be interpreted. And guess what? It gets interpreted by what people believe happened there in the past. The same is true for those rock layers that you see in that canyon wall. You know how those rock layers were formed one on top of another. That also gets interpreted by what people believe happened there in the past. 
The evolutionists tell us that each one of those fine sedimentary rock layers were slowly laid down over a period of a year or something along those lines. So when they look at these millions of fine sedimentary rock layers, one on top of another, they believe that they are looking at millions of years of Earth's history. And that's literally where the idea of millions of years first started. It was towards the end of the 1700s that geologists for the first time ever started speaking in terms of millions of years. You know, long before things like radiometric dating methods were even invented, carbon-14 dating methods were even invented. And there are problems with those dating methods. They are full of all sorts of assumptions. We have material on that. But just quickly to show you where the idea of millions of years originally started. It started from a belief system that rock layers were laid down slowly over millions of years. But now the interesting thing is the following, and it is that the great founding fathers of modern science and its famous people like Sir Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, and those guys, you know, back in their days, they also saw canyons, they also saw rock layers, but a guy like Newton never looked at rock layers and once saw millions of years in them. When Newton looked at rock layers, he always told himself, man, those rock layers are just a few thousand years old. Because Newton believed that that canyon and those rock layers were formed with Noah's flood about four and a half thousand years ago. But today we look at exactly the same rock layers that Newton saw. And what's usually the first thing that comes to mind when you look at a picture like that? What do you usually think of first? Oh, millions of years. Just look how old that canyon is. Now, why is that happening? Why is it that when we look at rock layers, we see millions of years in them? But when Newton looked at those rock layers, he only saw thousands of years in them. What has changed from Newton's time up to today? Because the evidence didn't change. It is exactly the same rock layers. But do you know what has changed? Our mindset. We've absolutely been indoctrinated and being evolutionized by the secular media and education institutions. That's trying to convince us that rock layers are proof positive of millions of years. And it's currently happening to your children and your grandchildren at school and at university. Now, when people start talking about rock layers, there's usually two things that will come up in the discussion. The first thing, of course, will be the millions of years. And then the second thing will be fossils, the remains of dead things, because we find these fossils in those sedimentary rock layers. So let's first have a look at what the world teaches us how the fossils formed in the past or how they are forming. They tell us that when a creature dies, like that crocodile, top left corner, it'll sink to the bottom of the river or the lake or the, you know, the body of water. And then top right, gradually, these rock layers will cover the dead creature there at the bottom. And then bottom left, the textbook actually says, it reads there, over millions of years. Do you see that word? They tell us that these rock layers will gradually harden one on top of another. And then the last picture, it tells us that through wind and water erosion, those upper rock layers will wash away or blow away. That will expose the fossils, and that is how we find the fossils today. But right, let's have another look at this explanation there, but from a more critical perspective. Because what you see there on the screen, happening there on the screen, is that what we observe today happening out there in nature? Because what happens to dead things that die in water? Where do they go? Dead fish in a dam. Do they sink to the bottom of the dam? Where do they go? They float. Dead things blow up. They float. And when things are floating at the surface of water, they're exposed to scavengers that will start to eat them. And they will start to decompose and rot away and break apart. And there will be basically nothing left to get fossilized. Even the bones that sink down to the bottom, there at the bottom, there are invertebrates like crabs, bacteria. You get worms that only eat bones that will literally break those bones down to dust. So that is not how you form a fossil at all. If you want to turn a creature into a fossil, for instance, this goldfish, what you need to do with gold is you need to go and bury her rapidly. So at one stage, instantaneously, we go and dump a massive amount of ground, mud, sediment on top of Goldie. There she is quickly, immediately covered, not exposed to scavengers that can feed on her. She's lying there intact as a whole, exposed to a minimum amount of oxygen and bacteria, so the decomposition process will be much slower. 
And if we have the right conditions in those sediments, the right pressure, temperature, moisture, minerals, etc., we can actually change that creature pretty rapidly into a fossil. And when we go to the fossil record today, we actually find evidence that creatures were buried rapidly in the past. Here is one of a fossilized fish. Tail is on the left, head is on the right, but look at its mouth. It is busy swallowing a smaller fish. So that guy got buried during his lunch break. That's how quickly it happened. Here is one of a female ichthyosaur. It's like a reptilian dolphin. They're extinct today. Head is on the left, tail is on the right, and we know it's a female because she's giving birth to a young one. So she got buried during the labor process, which once again was extremely quickly that it happened. But we are today not only being told that, you know, it takes millions of years for fossils to form, we're also being told by the world that fossils are millions of years old. But again, when we go to the fossil record today, we actually find evidence that even dinosaur fossils are relatively young. In 2005, Dr. Mary Schweitzer got the shock of her life when she discovered soft tissue in a dinosaur fossil. Now, she's an American paleontologist. They dug up that famous dinosaur, a T-Rex, in Montana, America. With the transportation process back to the laboratory, they had to break the two upper leg bones because it was just too big and too heavy to fit into that helicopter in one piece. So they broke it in half. They flew that skeleton out bit by bit. Back at the laboratory, the idea was just to go and glue those upper leg bones back together again. But before they did that, they told each other, you know what? Nowhere in the world are there people going around from museum to museum, breaking open dinosaur fossils to see what they look like on the inside. So, you know, it's just too valuable to break a dinosaur fossil. So here we have this opportunity. Let's first have a look on the inside before we glue this thing back together again. So they grabbed the microscopes, they had a look on the inside, and then they came across things that looked like sinews, blood vessels, blood cells. And Dr. Schweitzer said those things were still flexible and resilient. And when you stretch it out, it returns to its original shape. She uploaded some of those videos onto YouTube. You can go and have a look at it. And she says, if you smell the inside of that broken leg bone, it actually stinks like rotten meat. That's how fresh that thing was. Now, of course, she couldn't believe what she discovered. That's why she admitted that she did her experiment 17 times over just to make absolutely sure she really discovered soft tissue in a dinosaur fossil. Now, why was this such a huge find back in 2005? The stuff there on the screen that you can see, that primarily consists out of proteins. And we all know that proteins of dead things do not last very long. You know, a dead cat or a dog or a fish or whatever, they decompose and rot away pretty quickly. But, you know, here we still have this stretchy proteins in a fossil that's allegedly 65 million years old. I mean, logically speaking, it just doesn't make any sense. So that's why our organization believes that that fossil is maybe at the absolute maximum, only something like a thousand years old. Maybe only a few hundred years, but definitely not millions of years. That's just totally impossible. And since that discovery in 2005, scientists worldwide have discovered soft dinosaur tissue in those fossils more than 60 times already. And they do not have an explanation of how that stuff could have survived for 65 millions of years in those fossils. Now, what I've spoken to you and showed you up to now and still going to refer to primarily comes out of the magazine that we publish. We've been giving it out worldwide for more than 45 years now. It currently goes out to more than 110 countries worldwide. 56 pages, full color, glossy magazine. And we pride ourselves that our magazine do not have one single paid advertisement on one of its pages because we really believe that each one of our pages should be used to the absolute maximum to get this kind of information out into the world. Also, in, in the middle of each um, magazine, there's a whole section dedicated to the younger children. So again, just to save a bit of time, I will give an opportunity at the end of this presentation and you can subscribe to our family magazine. But I've got a question for you. See if you've been paying attention because I gave the answer away at the beginning. I want to know from you. Up to now, we've seen that those fossils were buried rapidly in the past. They formed quickly. They got buried rapidly. We also saw that fossils are not that old as the world wants us to think they are, that fossils are actually relatively young. So can you maybe think of a historical event somewhere in the Bible that could give us an explanation 
for the vast amount of sedimentary rock layers that we find today all over the earth. And remember, sedimentary rock layers are laid down by water. Water, there's a clue for you. And we find fossils in the sedimentary rock layers. So can you maybe think of a worldwide water event somewhere in the Bible? Noah's flood. I'm so glad somebody didn't shout out Jonah and the fish because people's <laughs> Bible knowledge is really terrible these days. It's, of course, the account of Noah's flood. Now, the Bible tells us that that was a literal, true worldwide event that occurred. There is a lot of people today out there in the world that do not believe this. A lot of theologians, a lot of scientists that do not believe this anymore. Now, they tell, not only in the world, but in South Africa, that's what they tell me over the telephone when I phone them to hear if we can do a presentation like this at their congregation. The guy on the other side of the line then sometimes tell me that, I must just remember that, that's like a mythical event in the Bible. It didn't really happen. The creation account, it's a mythical creation account. It didn't really happen that way. Now, with all due respect, you know, if, if theologians start saying things that differ from what the Bible says, then I'm, I don't usually listen any further to what they have to say. Because I go back to God's word to see what the Bible says. And what does the Bible teach us when it comes to Noah's flood? It says all the high hills and high mountains back in those days were covered with water up to seven meters high. So according to the Bible, it was a literal, true worldwide event. Now, if it really literally happened as described in the Bible, what would we then expect to find as evidence today on earth for such an event that occurred in the past? I think we'd expect to find sedimentary rock layers all over the world that was laid down by water with fossils in those rock layers. And guess what? That is exactly what we find today on earth. doesn't matter where we go and dig into the ground. We find these sedimentary rock layers that were laid down by water all over the earth with fossils in them. In fact, I don't know if you realize this, but God took four whole chapters in the book of Genesis just on this one account. And I think if God takes four chapters in the Bible on any account, I think he thinks it's pretty important stuff. And I think he wants to communicate it to us and tell us, listen, we should pay a bit more attention to what it says there. But what's usually the first thing that comes to mind when you look at a fossil? What do you think of usually the first thing? Millions of years. Brother, this thing, this is just like the evidence of millions of years. Not so? Now, why is that happening? Because that's how the world has taught us how we should think. Because that's not what should happen at all. Next time we look at a fossil, any fossil, because we believe the vast amount of fossils that we find today were laid down back in the days of Noah. This one probably also. So the next time you look at a fossil, do you know what should come to mind? You should tell yourself, wow, this fossil is the evidence of God's judgment on sin. Because this is what happened four and a half thousand years ago when man was so rebellious against God that he wiped them off the face of the earth. Only saved those eight people, together with those creatures on the ark, started over. And fossils and rock layers are the evidence of that judgment. Now again, very interesting, up to about 200 years ago, most of the people in the Western world believed it. Most theologians, most scientists believed in a literal worldwide flood. They believed in a literal six-day creation account. But ever since then, specifically Christians started to play around with the idea that, you know, maybe God created by means of evolution over millions of years. And I'm the first one today to admit that's what I believe. For the first three and a half years of my university career, you know, I was absolutely convinced that evolution is a fact of life. I mean, it has to be true. Just look at all the evidence for evolution there in nature. All the professor says it's the truth. The television says so. The textbook says it's the truth. It has to be true. I mean, now, thankfully, I didn't lose my faith at university. I still believe yeah, but the Bible also has to be true. So I tried to reconcile the two with each other. And what I did is usually the thing that most Christians do today. And that is we, listen, we go to the Bible or no, we go to the book of Genesis and we start to reinterpret God's word. You know, specifically those creation days. Who is to say those creation days were literal 24-hour days? The Bible also says that for God a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. You've heard that one? But you know what we do, in fact, when we start thinking that way? We start to put man's ideas and man's theories and science on a higher authority than God's word. And you can't do that because isn't the Bible like the highest authority for us here in this universe? So what we need to do is we need to get into the habit. doesn't matter which topic is being discussed, whether it is the topic of origins or things like you know, abortion, euthanasia, whatever. We should always start our thinking from God's word. We first go have a list of what God has to say concerning that specific topic. 
Then we have to listen to what man has to say about that specific topic. And if what man says differs from what it says in the Bible, then man is wrong. And then man has to change his ideas to fit into God's word because we cannot change scripture. And that's what I'm going to do now in the second half of this presentation. I'm only going to use the Bible now as our point of reference to see what scripture alone teaches us concerning how this universe got created. So when we go back to the creation week, it says at the end of the creation week, God looked at everything that he created and he said everything was not good, but very good. Actually, in the Hebrew context, it means he couldn't create it any better. It was like absolutely perfect. So what the Bible tells us is that at the end of the creation week, there was no such thing as death, pain, disease, suffering, bloodshed, no cancer, no you know, blue bull supporters, you know, things like that. You know, this perfect paradise in which we all live. In fact, God went to Adam and Eve and he commanded them to only eat of the plant material. So humans were originally vegetarian. The next verse, he went to the animals and he gave them exactly the same command. You are only allowed to eat of the plant material. So what the Bible teaches us is that at the end of the creation week, there were no carnivores, no meat eaters. Everything ate plant material. But today, we look at God's creation out there. And would you say the creation that we have today is still a very good creation? No, I don't think so. Wow. Everywhere you look. It's just death, pain, disease, suffering, destruction, and bloodshed all around us. What on earth is going on out there? Now, don't get me wrong. There is still a picture of God's goodness and of God's design, which is still visible today in nature. But it's been marked by all these terrible things that we see all around us. So again, let's start our thinking from the Bible and see if we can come to a logical explanation of of why the world is currently in the state that it is. Can you maybe think of an historical event somewhere in the Bible that could give us an explanation of what happened to that perfect good creation that God gave us originally and then changed it into one that we are stuck with today? Anybody? Sin. When they ate of the fruit, God came to Adam and said, Cursed is the world because of you. So today we live in a cursed, broken, fallen world. That's not how God gave it to us, and that's not how we wanted things to end up. I mean, he gave it to us perfectly. We humans messed up the end of God, and when we thought we knew better than God. And actually, God warned us in the previous chapter of Genesis what will happen if we eat of the fruit. He told Adam, for the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, again, in the Hebrew context, it actually means, Adam, from the day that you eat of that fruit, you will start to die. And you will carry on dying and carry on dying until you are eventually completely dead. In other words, Adam and Eve and all the living creatures started to age from that day forth. That's currently happening to all of us because of what happened there in the garden. You know, everything was originally created to live forever. There was no such thing as physical death on earth. And also, this is not just a spiritual death that's being referred to here. It's definitely also a physical death because we all know that verse in Genesis 3 verse 19 which says, From dust you were created, and to dust again you shall return. And then Paul comes along in the New Testament and he actually confirms to us this historical account that occurred there in the book of Genesis. He writes in Romans 5 verse 12, Therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. That's the origin of physical death. It comes from sin. In fact, physical death is the evidence that God is serious about sin. I mean, the Bible never separates the two. Right throughout Scripture, it's always sin and death, sin and death, sin and death. But it wasn't only man that got affected or got cursed on that day. It was actually God's whole creation, the universe. Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And those childbirth during pains, we can feel it every day of our lives. This is a terrible, terrible world we are currently living in. So what the Bible teaches us concerning how this universe came into existence is the following. It says, in the beginning, before Adam, there was no death, no pain, no sickness, no disease, no suffering, no bloodshed, none of those. But then we humans arrived on the scene. We rebelled against God. Sin came into this creation for the very first time. And what did we just read? What is the consequence of sin? Death, pain, disease, suffering, bloodshed, all those terrible things that we brought upon ourselves. And according to the Bible's genealogies, that event occurred only a few thousand years ago. 
that physical death and sin came into this universe for the very first time. But this is, of course, directly contradictory to what our children are currently being taught at school and university. Because what are they being taught? Evolution. And what does the theory of evolution say? For millions of years, death, pain, disease, suffering, and bloodshed has always been part of this creation. I mean, you need those things. If you want to develop from a simple creature to a more and more complex creature, that is exactly the kind of things that you need. But if that is true, if evolution is true, then it means there was physical death in this creation before God made Adam. There was physical death in this creation before Adam sinned. And that's directly contradictory to what we just read there in the book of Romans. And then a couple of chapters further on in the New Testament, Paul again comes along and then he actually comes and explains to us how we can actually only make sense of the death of Jesus on the cross in the light of a literal creation account. He writes in 1 Corinthians 15, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And again, not just the spiritual death that they refer to here, but a physical death. Because just think of it. Otherwise, then Jesus only had to come and die spiritually on the earth and be raised spiritually from that grave. But we know it's a physical death and a physical resurrection he went through. And then a, first, a few verses further on, Paul says that the first man, Adam, became a living being. And then the last Adam, referring here to Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. So here we have the two Adams there on the left. On the left, the first Adam. You can also see the tree there in the Garden of Eden a few thousand years ago. And then about 4,000 years later, Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Not the second one, but the last Adam. And again, the cross the tree on which he hung for our sin. And my question to you today is the following. Which of those two Adams is non-essential to the gospel message? And hopefully by now you've made the connection that you need both Adams to make sense of the gospel message. Just think of it. If there wasn't a literal good creation originally with a literal garden and a literal tree and a literal fruit and a literal snake and a literal um, sin occurred, if that didn't literally happen, why on earth did Jesus then die literally on the cross? Now, what is the message of the last Adam if there wasn't a literal first Adam? Can you see the connection? You see, Jesus' actions in history only make sense in the light of that first Adam's actions in history. Now, what we as an organization are not saying, we're not telling people, you know, you have to believe in a literal creation account to get to heaven. That's not what we are saying, because we believe it's through faith alone in Christ alone that we are saved by grace. But what we are saying is that you can't make sense of the gospel message if there wasn't a literal creation uh, account that happened. And there's a lot of Christians, millions today, that's not making that connection today. Unfortunately, the world is making that connection. You know, the atheists, the secular humanist scientists, they are making that connection between a literal creation account and the gospel message. And the world today out there knows the most effective way today to attack Christianity is to do what? It's not to go for Jesus then in the New Testament. No, they leave Jesus alone. Guess which part of the Bible is currently being attacked the most by the world? It's those first few opening chapters of the Bible, specifically Genesis 1 to 11. Why? Because the world knows. If it can sow doubt in people's minds concerning what the Bible says there, those people will doubt everything else they read further on in the Bible. And I showed you that right at the beginning of this presentation. It's been working brilliantly for the past 60 years in America. Those children in America do not believe in a literal creation account anymore. That's why when those kids get to the New Testament with all those miracles, they tell each other, well, that's not true. You can't walk on water. You can't change water into wine. It is scientifically impossible. That is just stories, not real. And ladies and gentlemen, it is coming. No. It's already 16 years in our high schools. Now, we are standing in front of this wave that is going to crash on us if we don't do something about it. I believe we still can do something about it. Now, we can get equipped with answers. Specifically, when our kids come to us, we can give them proper answers that makes logical sense so that they can see what's written in the Bible is the truth. And when you do proper scientific research, you can trust it. So let's summarize. What did you hopefully learn? This afternoon, hopefully you've seen that we are currently being told lies by the world concerning this topic of origins. You know, we are being bombarded by the theory of evolution, 
which is directly contradictory to that literal six-day creation account that we find in Genesis 1. Then hopefully you also saw that science, and I'm specifically referring here to those historical kind of science, those evolutionistic kind of sciences, that have become the absolute authority for a lot of people today on earth. And according to that kind of science, the Bible has been disproven already in Genesis chapter 1. And because of that, there is a massive increase in apostasy worldwide, specifically among young people. I mean, they don't even go to church anymore. They come to us with all the questions. They don't only go to the, the reverends and the ministers and the pastors. They come to us as parents and grandparents, and they want to know from us, Dad, where did Cain get a wife? Mom, where do all the different races come from? Granddad, where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And if we can't give proper answers to our children, do you know what the kids do? Google. Get into the world. Why? Because kids want answers to their questions. And if we are not going to give it to them, they're going to look for it in the world. And the world is more than willing to feed them with answers. And they're going, going to get fed with all the wrong stuff. That's literally where we are currently busy losing young people worldwide. Hopefully you saw this afternoon that there, that there are answers. There is an alternative to the theory of evolution and it is biblical creation. And I believe it's a better alternative because it fits in with the evidence that we have with us in the present. But also, as I said in the beginning, unfortunately, not a lot of people are currently being exposed to this kind of information. And those four points led to the last one. And it is that the Bible got disconnected from reality for a lot of people today, specifically the book of Genesis. You know, the world doesn't look at Genesis and see it as an historical document anymore. Of all 66 books in the Bible, can you maybe guess which book is currently being attacked the most by the world? It's Genesis. Why? Because it's the first book in the Bible. That is our foundation. That's our starting point. The rest of the Bible follows after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We built our whole Christian structure on this foundation of Genesis. And what happens to any building if you rip the foundation out? crumbles and even the psalmist knew this a couple of thousand years ago when he wrote if the foundations are destroyed what can the righteous do so you see ladies and gentlemen christians don't realize how important the book of genesis is to the rest of our christian faith because if we can't trust the bible there where can you start to trust the bible and that's more or less what jesus was trying to tell nicodemus that evening he came to him in john 3 look what he asked he said nicodemus if i have told you earthly things and you do not believe how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, is it any wonder that people out there in the world today, they do not believe in a literal creation account anymore, that do not believe in a literal worldwide flood? Is it any wonder they doubt things like a virgin conception, to be raised from the dead, to live forever? I mean, those things are scientifically impossible. Quickly back to our magazine. Now, of everything we've produced over the past over 40 years, this is by far the best resource that we have. And we know this is the best thing that we have because people keep telling us that it is the best thing we have, literally year after year after year. So what the magazine does is it looks at all these so-called evidences for evolution that you see every day on the television, read about in the newspapers every day. And then from a scientific biblical perspective, our people write easy to understand articles so that you can make sense of those so-called evidences. Now we show them you how it actually better fits with biblical history and we show you also the weaknesses in those scientists, in those evolutionist arguments. And literally the biggest part of this presentation today comes directly just like that out of the magazine. So the magazine is really something that we encourage people to get linked to because, you know, within a week or two, I think most of you will forget most of what I said here today, but the magazine is something that will actually come into your house quite frequently, bring the information into your home and keep you up to date with the latest news. And literally over the years, we've had thousands of life-changing testimonies from people because of the information they were exposed to in the magazine. Now, the magazine is a quarterly magazine, so there's only four issues every year. And you can subscribe every time just for a year at a time or for three years at a time. And as you can see, a three-year subscription works out a bit cheaper. And then when you subscribe to the magazine, you will for free get it digitally. And then you can upload it onto five different electronic devices. So it will arrive per email at your house. And then you can just send it to four other email addresses. So you can subscribe your children, your grandchildren, friends, and family for either a year or for three years at a time. Now, you can also subscribe at our website at creation.com. But if you subscribe with me today, you will get a couple of things that is for free. Now, can I maybe just see who likes stuff that's for free? 
Uh, the right crowd. Excellent. So if you subscribe with me today for a year, I will give you a free backdated issue of the magazine because we want you to get exposed to this information from as early as possible and get reading from as early as possible. And if you subscribe for three years, I will give you not one, but two free magazines. Now, unfortunately, the problem is the South African Postal Service because over these years, we've made use of them, specifically the northern provinces. They tell us it's non-existent anymore. In the Western Cape, it seems like it's still working. So I don't know if you want to take the chance and subscribe. I still get mine. I live in Woolsey, just over the mountain. I still get mine every term. But if you think, man, I'm not going to get that thing in the post, then we've got this option for you. Then you can only subscribe digitally. So then it works out about half price. You're not going to get a free gift today because they will already next week send you the latest electronic version when I hand in the paperwork at the office, office in Durbanville. Uh, but um, I brought old magazines with me and you can buy it in stacks of 10 and then it is on discount prices. And then you can subscribe today physically, uh, electronically for the latest one, but you can take old magazines home because you know, like me, I like something in my hands. So come and chat with me there at the back. The forms that we are going to circulate, they look like this. All you need to do is just indicate to me your option. This guy wants the three-year physical snail mail magazine at home. So you tick it off on the left, tick it off on the right. Then you fill in your information where we should mail it if you want it in the post. Telephone number, email address. If you only want it electronically. You only tick the boxes to the right-hand side. But then you don't have to fill in a postal office or a street address. Just please make sure your email address is there. And then you will see it's little tear off pieces of paper there, perforated. So tonight, now, you tear it off, keep it with you. And when we finish here, at the back, at the book table, you please today bring that little blue paper and come and pay today and get your free gift today please a lot of people forget to bring it i do have a card machine with which you can pay or if you want to pay later on throughout the week i do have our banking details so I'll, I'll, you can take anything on the table i will give you our banking details but then you must please just promise somewhere in the week just to make the payment right so those forms again are you going just same as as earlier on they're going to circulate it again just send it down the rows to the back while you are filling it in. I'm just going to show you quickly one or two things that you can expect to find in the magazine, things that published in the past. A lot of people tell us, okay, but if you guys say the earth is young, how is it possible that rock layers like that can form rapidly? I mean, doesn't those rock layers take like millions of years, long ages to form? Then we tell people, no, if conditions are good, you can actually form rock layers like that pretty rapidly. Now, up to that yellow line, it's about eight meters high from where that person is standing down there at the bottom. And those eight meters high sedimentary rock layers were deposited within three hours. Eight meters high. Yes. How do we know that? We actually observed it happening. It happened at Mount St. Helens, a volcano that erupted in 1980, Washington State, North America. About a week after the eruption, there was a pyroclastic flow, which is basically hot ash and gas and dust that got blown out of that mountain at 160 kilometers per hour. And within three hours, those dust particles in the atmosphere came down onto that floodplain and it formed those rock layers, one on top of each other, eight meters high within three hours. In the months after that eruption, there were more of these pyroclastic flows. And there were areas where in total, those rock layers were laid down 200 meters high within a couple of months. So if conditions are good, you can form these things pretty rapidly. Something else that can form pretty quickly is a canyon. Now, the world teaches us that canyons are formed by that little river down there at the bottom. Gradually, over these millions of years, that canyon gets carved out deeper and deeper, like one sand grain at a time. So the deeper the canyon is, the older the canyon is. But that canyon also formed at Mount St. Helens about... Two years after the eruption, there was a massive mudslide high up on the mountain. It rushed down the mountain. It ripped that canyon open 40 meters deep, 40 there on that picture. And it happened within one day. The canyon in that picture is one day old with that little river running there at the bottom. So there's two ways you can look at something like canyon formation. You can say, all right, what do I need? I need a little bit of water and lots of time. Or you can say, no, you need a lot of water and a little bit of time, and you will sit with basically the same end result. Then over the years, also, literally, we've discovered thousands of man-made articles that solidified, turned into rock-solid fossils. Here is a soft hat, which a miner forgot in a mine, Tasmania, Australia. The mine was closed for 50 years. 
After 50 years, for the first time, they went back into the mine. They saw this hat lying there in the mine water. When they picked it up, they realized it turned into a split rocker within 50 years as it absorbed those minerals out of the mine water. This is a fossilized bag of flour, and that flour also solidified rock art, and it, it was uh, discovered in an abandoned mill in America, and it formed so quickly that the stitching pattern that was in the bag, which surrounded the flour, the bag rotted off, but when it was still around in, on the flour, the, the pattern that it made in the flour got fossilized in that flour that was left. And then finally, you'll see there's a couple of books and things that I brought along. Those are literally just the core resources that we have. There are much more that you can order online from creation.com. We make use of courier services, so you will definitely receive it at home, but you will have to pay, unfortunately, extra for the courier service. If you want to save on courier service, you can either get it today with me or you can visit our office. As I said, it's in Durban. Also. So for the Cape Townians, you can come and visit the office and have a look there. But a lot of people ask me always, what is the best thing on that table that really just summarizes everything? It is undoubtedly the red book. There's a whole pile of them lying there. It's more in the box under the table. 60 of the most asked questions we've received over the years concerning topics of creation, evolution, origins, science, book of Genesis being answered in that one book. You know, where did Cain get a wife? Where did the races come from? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? How did Noah get all the animals on the ark? And how do these dating methods work? And what happened to the human fossils? Anything you can think of answered in that one book next to it you will see there is a pile of blue books now this is our most popular creation book of all time it was written by our head scientist dr jonathan safati and he focused on all these so-called evidences for evolution you know these so-called missing links which are still missing so-called whale evolution that occurred human evolution and one by one very simply shows you the weaknesses in those scientists in those evolutionist arguments. And what I love about the blue book, it's currently the stuff that the grade 12s are being taught, life science and first year BSc at university. So if you have a child or a grandchild that wants to go and study in the natural sciences, that direction, please just get the blue book for them so that they don't get to university and go lose their faith over there. And if you are maybe thinking, man, I should get that red book and the blue book, then I've got some good news for you. Because if you buy the two, you will get a free DVD that goes along with it. If you don't have a free a DVD player anymore, then you can give it away for free to one of your friends or family that do have a player. For those of you who really want to go in depth, this is literally the Rolls Royce of creation books. It is an 800 page verse by verse commentary just on Genesis 1 to 11. Again, written by Dr. Safati. This is not only a theological commentary and a historical commentary, it is also a scientific commentary. And it goes back to the original Hebrew and first Greek translation of Genesis 1 to 11 to have a look within context what it says there. As I said with the DVDs, it's phasing out. People are streaming, so you can um, stream via our website also. But if you still have a DVD player and you like DVDs, I've got lots there at the back, and they're literally below cost price. So we just the old stock that we have that we still try to get rid of. Our website, just again, creation.com. Please tell your friends and family about our ministry. You can see on the website where we do these presentations. If you zoom into one of those countries, like South Africa, for instance, those dates will pop up from time to time. And if you click on a date, it will show exactly in which town we are, the date, the time, the address, which church, everything is there. So if you maybe have friends or family close to those towns, please encourage them to come and have a listen to what we have to say. Then they can bring their friends from town. And in that way, we can also spread this message a bit faster here throughout South Africa. Also go to Namibia once a year, usually during the month of August. So beginning next year, hopefully those dates will start to appear there. And then finally, I want to encourage you guys to, to visit our website and, and read some of those articles. Literally, if it is only like one every week, not only to get answers to your questions, but to really get better equipped to share the gospel message more effectively in the secular world. I'm ending off with what Paul wrote there in Romans 10 where he said, how are they to hear without someone preaching? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Right, so that's what I have to say. I don't know if there are maybe questions, something that you heard here tonight or something that you've always wondered about. I don't have all the answers. I will try my best. I know of a very good website that will probably give you a better answer so I can do it. But I know if there's maybe questions, something that, that you've always wondered about and you can... Quickly have a look at that. Yes. Is there scientific evidence for the Jonah and the whale? Can it be fish? 
Can we live inside of the <laughs> Well, I always tell the children, let me ask you a question before I give you the answer. What is the biggest miracle in the Bible? Yeah, by far, the biggest miracle in the Bible. Nothing beats that. No, 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 no. Much bigger than that. Who knows? No, bigger than that. I'll give you a clue. You all know that verse by heart. All of you. Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning. If you can make something out of nothing, what is it to let a virgin fall pregnant? What is it to raise a dead guy? What is it to let somebody survive three days in a whale or a shark or whatever it was? So there's no scientific proof of that. But, I mean, if the Bible is true in the beginning that God made everything out of nothing, he could have made Jonah survive for those three days in whatever it was, a whale or a fish or a big swimming creature. Let's call it a big swimming creature. So I can't scientifically prove it to you. But, I mean, if God can make something out of nothing, I'm sure he can make Jonah survive. I'm sure he raised Jesus from the dead. So that's how I would answer that question. I think there was a, was there a hand on that side? Yes. Yes, yeah, that's side. Oh, for the board. Yes. Yes, that is a good question and a very easy answer. I got exposed to this information. Okay, it's, let me take a, a while there. I, I, I grew up in a Christian now. My dad was a, a life science teacher as well, but we were never taught evolution back in those days, in the 90s. It was like part of the, like, like an addendum in the textbook. So if you want to, you can have a look at it. But back in those days, evolution wasn't taught. But they already brainwashed us at school to get us ready for universe. And that was very easy how they did it. The grade 11, standard Nierge textbooks, they started with the amoeba, simple cell organism. Next chapter, the hydra, multicellular organism. Then the fish, then the amphibians, then the reptiles, then the birds. You see the evolutionary progress? And they ended off with the human body. So they kind of like prepared you for university. So when I got to university, we were just bombarded by evolution. The first time we really heard about it and everything in millions of years. And I thought, well, this has to be true because these guys can't be wrong. They're all professors and PhDs. They have to be right. But the Bible is also true. So maybe, and actually in my second year, uh, we did a paleontology course. And in the course work, it says, some Christians believe that God created by means of evolution. It was like lights going on for me. Wow. God used evolution. That is a proven fact. And, and my dad, I remember he found that I was during my honor degree. I did the first time we did intensively, we did evolution. My dad found me and he said he just did a, like a discipleship course at home. And they, they discussed this topic on creation, evolution. And, and they actually see, they watch the video that says the earth is only a few thousand years old and evolution is nonsense. And I actually burst out laughing over the phone. I said, dad, how can you be so stupid? I mean, this is scientific. I'll come home. During the June holidays, and I'll bring you just back on track because you are clearly way off track. So I went home. Like, you know, you can't teach a postgraduate student anything. And I thought, I'll, I'll teach my dad. And it got, there was still a video back then, three hours long. And I watched the video. And after an hour, I was very critical, very critical. But I just, the Lord just kept me on that pillow. I just sat there and I just kept watching. And the further I watched, the more quieter I became. And I just realized what this guy says makes sense. And what caught my attention was the reference probably to dinosaurs in um, Job 40 and Job 41, the behemoth and Leviathan. And when he said that Noah's flood was probably the trigger which formed all the fossils, the majority of the fossils and the geological things that we see today was due to Noah's flood. That got my attention. So I stopped the video after an hour and a half and I told my dad, I do not believe in evolution anymore and I am not going back to university. And he said, no, you are going back to university because I paid until the end of the year. So, <laughs> so very reluctantly, I went back to university. I was furious with the university. I couldn't believe. And the first guy I went to was my professor. I knew he was a Christian and I told him, I said, professor, I just watched the video that says, I was kind of like challenging him to see what he's going to say. I didn't care what happened. You know, my marks and stuff towards the end of the year. And I said, professor, I just watched the video that says the earth is only a few thousand years old and evolution is nonsense. And I think I believe it. And they looked at me and he said, Peter, never in my life have I ever believed in evolution cannot happen. He said, I said, what? You are teaching this stuff to us. He says, yes. You know why I'm teaching it to you? I have to teach it to you. Doesn't mean I believe it. 
I said, why did you say anything? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And he said, he's got no idea. He doesn't know. He doesn't know where Cain got a wife. He doesn't know where all the races come from. He knows one thing. Evolution cannot work from a scientific perspective. I said, wow. So I told him, I, I came across a website, our website. I'll go and do a bit of research for us. And I, I got a couple of articles, Cain, Cain's wife, uh, the different races, and the dinosaurs. Those three. I printed it out. I threw it under his door. The next morning, he came into my office. He said, did you throw that stuff under my door yesterday? I said, yes. He said, I read that stuff last night. For the first time in my life, everything makes sense to me. Now, I can also, it fits exactly in with science. It fits exactly in with the Bible. No problem there. So that's how I came yeah, to this conclusion. It happened to me quite quickly. I've got friends. Uh, one of my lecturers that still is, a, you know, he believes God used evolution to create everything afterwards now, 20, 30 years. So for some people, it happens quickly. For other people, it takes a long time. I don't know why. I don't know why. But that's, that's my story in short. Maybe I can just quickly add on to it. It's a long story, but I wanted to do a PhD via the University of Stellenbosch uh, concerning evolution. I got referred to a, a lecturer there, a PhD scientist. He did a PhD at the University of um, Johannesburg, I think, on, in botany. And I told her about my idea of a PhD in, in education um, a direction among school teachers in the Western Cape. She was elated about this topic. Oh, this is going to be brilliant. Such this is so needed. Everything I said, oh, wonderful, doctor. There's maybe one problem. I don't believe in evolution. She was sitting, okay. I said, I'm a, what they call a creationist. She said, okay. I'm also a Christian. I said, wonderful. But can I ask doctor just one question? One question. What do we creationists, what exactly do we believe concerning genetics, concerning the fossils, concerning those kind of things. Exactly. What do we believe? And she looked at me and she said, you know what? I don't know. I know you believe everything God created, everything in six days. I said, yes. But further on, she said, I don't know. I said, may I just inform you? But she says, yeah, please do. And I started telling her what we believe exactly concerning genetics, fossils, and so forth. She stopped me after, I think it was five minutes. And she stopped me and she said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If what you are saying is true, then it means that fossils couldn't form before the fall because there was no death on earth before the fall. I said, yes, we believe the vast majority of fossils formed during Noah's flood. She said, that makes sense. You know what? I don't believe in evolution anymore. The Lord turned her around in five minutes. I couldn't believe it. And ever since then, she invites me back to the university to address postgraduate students. And I do a, a bit more technical talk to them. They are atheists and Muslims and all kinds of faith in the classroom. But I just do a, just a scientific, let's look where the evidence leads us to show them that the evidence do not support the theory of evolution. It supports like a literal beginning at the beginning. So you know, praise Lord for that. It's been 10 years. This year I did my 10th presentation at the University of Stellenbosch, postgraduate students, like 50 in the classroom. And they, they come to me afterwards, the majority of them, they tell me, I, we couldn't believe what we heard here today. This makes absolutely sense. Why do we only hear this stuff now in our lives? And I tell them, you know what? Satan knows if you hear this stuff one, one time, you will never again in your life believe in evolution. People should just get exposed. They just sit down, just listen to what we have to say, and then just make up your own mind. We're not forcing anything onto people, but this stuff just makes more sense. Okay, that was a long answer. Next question. Okay, let's give you a chance, and then there, yeah, at the front, yeah, this one. Uh, along these lines of getting into more detail, and people, and people who are uh, studying in, in, in science and so on, uh, CMI also brings out to the journal. Yeah, the Journal of Creation, a more technical thing. Why don't you give a few comments on that so that people can you know, access it on the internet and uh, make use of the regular to other people? Yeah, I guess you can also, I'm not sure, but I think you can also just digitally subscribe for that. It's called the Journal of Creation. It is peer-reviewed by PhD scientists, but it is very technical sometimes. So people who are specific scientists or love science, um, it's more for them. With this... Creation magazine that I showed, that is a family magazine. That's literally easy to understand. But the Journal of Creation is a bit more technical, a bit more sciencey, put it that way. But you can also subscribe for that. You can have a look at that. I don't advertise it because very few people in my talks subscribe for that. But you can have a look at it on the internet or maybe subscribe a friend or a family member, maybe who's, who's a scientist, PhD, or whatever, subscribe them for a year maybe and let them just have a look at it, be exposed to the information, and then they can yeah, see what we're about. But it's like a peer review scientific journal. Okay. 
I'll show you pictures. I'm a teacher, no picture person. Right, the dinosaurs. Actually, the answer is in the red book. So if you just buy the red book, you know, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> right, let's look at the dinosaurs. Here they are. Okay, this is the, the children Bible I, I got brought up on. Children Bible book. What is wrong with that picture? Adam, oh, is that again? It's not showing. Okay, it's coming. Is it coming? Yeah. All right, there. Good. What is wrong with that picture? There's a couple of things wrong, but the major thing there. What is missing there? Dinosaurs. Why are dinosaurs never drawn in a children's Bible's picture book? Because the people who draw these pictures are all evolutionized. They are sitting at, they never saw what it looked like in the Garden of Eden. They are sitting around thinking, I think this is what it looked like. And I can't draw a dinosaur here because scientists tell us they died out millions of years ago. So just a cow and a dog and a cat. That's literally what's happening. And we are showing pictures like that to our children. No wonder they turn their back on the Bible when they reach high school. They're being taught about evolution, dinosaurs, millions of years because the Bible says only thousands of years. And here's no dinosaurs. It means the Bible is wrong because dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Mom, Dad, I'm an atheist. I don't believe the Bible. Science disproved it. That, that's a massive big problem. Our children Bible pictures. Here's another one that's, that's drawn wrong. What's wrong with that picture? A couple of things. Let's start with Noah's Ark. What is wrong with that Ark? Too small. When I showed that picture for the first time to my eldest girl, she was five years old. The first words out of her mouth were, Daddy, how is the elephant going to fit into the ark? said, brilliant, my child. You can think critically about things in life. I love it. So the ark is too small. What does the Bible say? 135 meters long, 13 meters wide, and uh, 23 meters wide, and 13 meters tall. So that is the wrong picture. And what is missing there? What animals are missing there? Dinosaurs. What does the Bible say? All the land creatures went into that ark. Now, usually the, the thing is the people tell us, oh, you Christians are so stupid. Your ark is too small and dinosaurs were so big, they will never fit into the ark. You know what? First of all, that is the wrong ark. And secondly, God didn't have to send the biggest animals onto the ark. We think he sent young animals onto the ark because young animals are smaller. They take up less space. They weigh less. They eat less. It's less waste to clean. They sleep most of the time. What are you going to do in the ark all that time? How long were they on the ark? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. nights. More than a year. What are you going to do on the ark? So younger animals, they handle much easier. You can put them in cages. You can stack the cages. Younger animals um, will re recover faster from sicknesses and diseases. But the number one thing about young animals is they will live much longer after the flood. Because the idea was survive the flood and repopulate the earth afterwards. So we think God just sent young animals. So this is the kind of pictures we should show our children. That's born on scale. There are Noah's family, and there are the animals coming with dinosaurs, and it's not the biggest giraffes, not the biggest dinosaurs, not the biggest elephant. So we should show the right pictures. Now, don't take your Bible and go look for the word dinosaur, because you will not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. Neither will you find the word rugby, motor car, or computer in your Bible, <laughs> because those are all modern words. But there is a word specifically in the Old Testament. You find it in the old, in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. You will find that word 35 times in the Old Testament. And if you take that word out and you put the word dinosaur in, it, it actually fits pretty good. Now, what could that be? I'm going to show you a picture. What kind of a creature is that? Dragon. 35 times in the 1611 King James Version. If you go and buy a King James Version today, you will only find the word dragon 16 times in the Old Testament. They've changed it 19 times. And I know a lot of the, of the English um, Bibles, you won't find the word dragon in the Old Testament anymore. They've taken it out 35 times. Most of the times they've substituted it with the word jackal. Yeah. Now, why did that happen? It's because Bible translators over the years came across the word dragon in the book of Isaiah, the book of Psalms. And they said, well, this can't be a dinosaur because they died out millions of years ago. It must have been a jackal. And they literally changed it. It speaks about a flying dragon in Isaiah, sea dragons in Isaiah, sea monsters and sea dragons in the book of Psalms. It's all there. So our children, we don't have children Bible, Bibles, we have children books. And our children books, we draw them, I believe, correctly. We draw dinosaurs from day six with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We draw our ark the right size and we draw dinosaurs going onto that ark. Because we should 
we should um, get into the habit to, a lot of parents come to us and then they tell us, well, you guys don't have to worry. I'm not going to expose my child to evolution. And then that child is like six, seven years old. And then I say, look at this. I said, uh, boy, uh, just tell me uh, we, what happened to the dinosaurs? Your womb is millions of years ago when that big rock fell on the earth. Then that mother's eyes like this. Who taught him this? Walt Disney. So those children are already evolutionized. So what we say is no. Do not keep your child away from evolution. Expose him to evolution because he's going to get, you know, introduced to it at some stage. But at the same time, giving the right biblical answers um, and teach him how to think biblically, critically about what he sees in the media and read and so forth. But expose the kids to them because they're already being exposed to it via the media. So that's a more or less way. But just to show you, I didn't lie. Chapter 19 in the Red Book, whole chapter on dinosaurs and dragons actually in Elgo. And maybe just say the word a dinosaur was the first time used in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. He was a curator, curator at the Natural British, British Natural History Museum in England. So back in these days, they started to build more buildings and roads and they had to dig into the ground more. And they came across fossils every time, huge bones. And they realized these were fossils of creatures that lived in the past. Quite clearly, they're extinct now. We don't know what they were. They look like these giant lizard things. Let's call them big, terrible lizards. And that's the two Hebrew words, dinosauros, which means big, terrible lizard. In Afrikaans, it's a skrik akadus. So these big, terrible lizards that lived. At the, so only from 1841, they started to use the word dinosaur. So you will only find the word, you won't find the word dinosaur in the Bible, but dinosaurs, the dragons, they are there in the Bible from the beginning. Yes. Just a quick question. Um, uh, just to give you some feedback. Uh, it's wrong that, that there was no cars in the Bible. Uh, because Moses had talked in his trunk. That's true. <laughs> and, and, and the disciples were all in one accord. It's a wonder. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I just wanted to ask with regards to creation whether creation is a six day creation or a seven day creation. But say again, did you repeat? Creation, a six-day event or a seven-day event? Well, God worked for six days, if you want to put it in that context. Is that what you mean? He yeah. created for six days, but he rested on the seventh day. So the seventh day is, is part of the creation? Well, we, it's, it's technical. Well, not technical. What do you mean? The creation week is referred to the seven days. Worked six days and took a day off. So that's the week that we still use today. That's what he told Moses. I worked for six days. I took a day off. Follow my example. So sometimes they say, you know, the, the seven-day cre creation week. Very seven days, but he, he worked for six days he created. So sometimes it's just, yeah, you have to clarify there. Yes. You mentioned you watched a video at that conference to within an hour and a half. Yes. Now, what is the type of that video? Who made it? And I'd like to buy a copy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It is, it is old. He made that. It was Dr. Philip Stott. I don't know if you've heard of him. I got that video from Quasi Sabantu back in the 90s. I ordered it from, from KwaZulu Natal. Dr. Philip Stott, he's got a PhD. I think he's, a, he's a, um, in physics. Physics. And he's still alive. I know his daughter also got a PhD in science. I'm not sure where he lives. I actually, this is also, this is the Lord. Nin it was 1999. In the middle of my honors year, I saw this video. Dr. Philip Stott, I, there was a, in, in Bloemfontein, the next, when I got back to university, there was like this missions week at university, and I bought creation books that they had, and I told him, you know, I told the lady at the counter, I actually, I actually watched the video of Dr. Philip Stott. Oh, she says, yeah, you can order that video from Kwasi Sabantu. And, and so I ordered the video, and I think in the video, I must have found his email address, I'm not sure. And I wrote an email to him, and I said, Dr. Stott, I just want to tell you that thank you for your video. I watched it. I'm studying here at the University of Bloemfontein, and I was wondering, you now, if you do presentations like that, maybe if you would be available at university, and what your expenses would be, and, and where you live in South Africa. He wrote back within an hour, saying, I live in Bloemfontein, and I'm more than willing to come to the university for free. So we booked him at the university. A lot of professors and doctors and so forth. And he did like an hour presentation. I don't think he convinced a lot of people. I think he brought a lot of uh, food for thought for a lot of them. But he actually, that just, the Lord just provided. Out of the blue, this guy lives in Bloemfontein. So, but I, I think he's still alive. Yeah, there's videos of him on, on YouTube. Just type in Philip Stott. But some of the, there, there are better things that's been discovered since that video. I think that video was made in the 1980s, I think, maybe. 
So we've got <laughs> nice stuff up there that's actually better. <laughs> Have you got any of the videos of Professor I've seen his stuff. Yeah, well spoken. We've actually had an interview with him in our 99 issue of the journal when he was still the chair of um, zoology at the University of Western Cape. Yeah, I use his quote still today at the University of Stellenbosch where he says, natural selection leads to a loss of genetic information. So how can the textbook say you need that natural selection makes simple creatures more and more and more complex? You see, what you observe in the laboratory and in nature is exactly the opposite. That's 1999 issue. I don't think we have that issue anymore. Yeah, so he's on side with, with what we believe with the creation stuff. Yeah. No, we don't sell his stuff because he's not part of us. We've got better things. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> We've got, um, we've got seven offices around the world, so the vast majority of those presentations are by our American scientists and the Australian scientists. Our organization started in 1978 in Brisbane, Australia, with an atheist that came to know the Lord. He was a medical doctor, and he started the, the um, ministry, and he, he gave up half the day. He gave up his practice, and he, he did research on this, and he wrote articles. That's how the magazine got started, and then more scientists joined him over the years. And so from Australia, they sent out a guy to America and later on to England. And in South Africa, we started in, I think, 2002, 2003. They, they started the branch in South Africa. So the, the, it started in Australia, but most of our guys are Australian or, or um, American scientists. Yeah, but there are DVDs there at the back. I can show you literally what, what's the best ones. That's moving more or less on the, on the same part that Dr. Philip Stott, that video that I saw. I'll show you which, which are the best ones. If you're interested in it. Yeah, cheap. Yes. Yeah, most of them. But I must say there are um, <laughs> fossils that we've discovered that they fossilize so well. You can see the color pigmentation still in the skin of Donna. That's how brilliantly they fossilized. And to show again, it's not that old. But most of the time, it's it generally we didn't have a problem with what they look like. But what we do have a problem sometimes is how fast those things ran, how many eggs they laid, what's the noise they made. Because Jurassic Park, you know, that's a movie. Okay, those things run like at the speed of white lightning and stuff like that. How do you know how fast that thing ran? How do you know what sound it made? So it's, it's important for us to let the children just make that distinction. So there were creatures like, like, like that. They probably looked like that. But when it comes to how fast they ran, how far, what they ate, how many eggs they laid, stuff like that, nobody was there to observe it. That's proper science. So those things that you see, Jurassic Park, stuff like that, that is speculation. Could be that they are correct on some of the things, but there's no way we can prove that they can prove it or that we can prove that they are right or wrong. So we should just make that distinction. What's proper science and what is speculation? Yes. Uh, yeah, the thing, do you are you asking why we think? Where are they? Well, interesting question. In the red book, chapter 19. <laughs> You will get the answer, but I'll show you a couple of... I've got a whole talk just on dinosaurs. Let me just get the English one. I think it's this one. When... Um, this is also what he referred to in his DVD, Dr. Philip Stott. This is what got my attention. The oldest book in the Bible is probably the book of Job. Now, people think he lived during the time of Abram. Uh, this one. He lived during the time of Abram. That's a couple of hundred years after the flood. And God came to Job and he said, Behold the behemoth which I made with you. Now, behemoth, is it on the screen? Okay. So it'll come, it'll come. The word behemoth is the Hebrew word which means the beast of beasts. So God is telling Job, there is a creature standing there in the river, the beast of beasts, which I made along with you. So some people think, yeah, maybe it is like a hippopotamus or it's an elephant because that's the biggest creature we know of. Yeah, today, that's a lie. But what's important, God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Footnotes are man-made things, so we must just be careful of that. And then God starts to describe this creature, and he says he makes his tail as stiff like a cedar tree. Now, this is what a cedar tree looks like. That one washed up in America 2010, 65 meters long. So God says when you look at this creature, the first thing that comes to mind, wow, his tail looks like a cedar tree. 
Now, Job knew what a cedar tree looked like. I mean, 70 time, 72 times in the Old Testament, it's referred to the cedars of the Lebanon. That's the flag of Lebanon. Now, I'm going to show you the tail. First of an elephant, then of a hippo. And you tell me if you agree if that's a good comparison. Right, there's the hippo, or the elephant. And it gets worse with the hippo. Look at that thing. It is not a hippo and it is not an elephant. Now, from the fossil record, we actually know that there were creatures with massive big tails. If you look at the bones, for instance, the sauropod dinosaurs, which we know from the fossil record were probably the biggest land animal. So there God is telling Job a couple of hundred years after the flood, there is probably the sauropod dinosaur, which I made along with you. And then it goes on, you know, its bones are like bronze, his limbs like iron your massive bone structure. That's just a front limb, massive creature. And then God tells Job, he is the first of the works of God. So I can't prove it to you, but it sounds like a sauropod a dinosaur. Then it goes on a couple of slides further in my talk. I refer back to it. Um, let me just find it. Uh, uh, it's not that. Where is it now? I skipped it. Okay, just hang on, just hang on. I'll show you the pictures. Oh, yeah, man. Did I miss it? Just trying to think where in the talk it is. Uh, it was, no, it's not this one. It's coming, it's coming. No. Oh, here it is. All right, then we go back to Job. And then a bit further on in Job. The verse will be there, Job 40. God says he lives in the shelter of reeds and in the marsh. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. Now, the river, he refers, God is referring to is the river Jordan. And the Jordan gets up to 10 meters deep at some places. And God says the, the river Jordan is in flood. And this thing is not disturbed. He lives there in the marsh. Now, the biggest marsh today we know of is in Central Africa, the Congo Basin. Now, when Belgium colonized the Congo they actually, in 1885. They sent their missionaries into the Congo to tell the people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the people lived basically on the outer rim of the marsh because it is just too big and too dangerous and too vast to live in the center. So today, even today, the Congo Basin is 80% unexplored. Basically, just on the outer rim that people can go. It is huge, massive rainforest there. And when the missionaries got them, they started to communicate to these people. These people actually told them about funny creatures still living in those forests. And they drew on the ground long neck, long tail dinosaurs. Those stories were reached America and reached Europe in 1990. These articles were published in the newspapers in Europe and in America of the Congo swamp monsters. These people call them Mokele Memembe, which means the one that stops the flow of the river. They say these things are very aggressive. They chase away hippos and crocodiles. They themselves don't see them that often. They are um, semi-aquatic and nocturnal. So the only times they basically see them is if they're lucky and they see these long necks come out of the marsh, out of the water, and they disappear again under the water. And then they told the missionaries of their ancestors who at some stage were able to catch a small one and they killed it and they actually ate it. So it could be that there are maybe still dinosaurs alive somewhere in isolated pockets in the world. Same stories uh, come out of the rainforest in South America and Brazil. Massive big rainforest. We haven't been on every square inch of those rainforests. And sometimes you get stories, if it's true, I don't know, of um, these pterodactyls, flying reptiles from Papua New Guinea. Those rainforests also like semi-explored. So I don't know. Could be Megalodon could still be alive. We've only been in 5% of the world ocean. That's basically only the surface. It is 95% unexplored. It is just too big. There's just too much water on the surface of this earth. So it could be that there are still here or there. Maybe some of these guys still survived. That's why we won't be surprised if they find a real one today on earth. You know, I'd just like to know the excuse that the evolutionists will have. But to us, we will just say, well, it survived the flood. It was still alive. It just survived there in the forest up to now. So, yeah. Don't know if that answers the question. Right, somebody else maybe? A last question, yes. There's a microphone. Okay, continental drift. Right, so we believe that all the continents were together at some stage. We don't have a problem with that because the Bible actually seems to teach that in Genesis um, on day three. 
God says he let the waters get together in one spot and the land appeared. So it's just logical. If the waters, I just want to try and find a picture. If the waters, ah, oh, I don't have a picture. No, this one will have to do. No, that won't work. Oh, never mind. Um, so the land appeared, not the land. So it seems like the water in one spot, the land were in another spot. But now from a biblical perspective, we need a worldwide cataclysmic event that could have ruptured that one continental shelf and move them away from each other. So can you maybe think of an historical event somewhere in the Bible that could give us an explanation what could have wrecked havoc on the earth to break that one continental shelf, crack it into all the different continents that we find today? Probably Noah's flood again. So in the past, we used to say continental drift, but that is actually, it's not being used anymore. What they talk about today is catastrophic plate tectonics. Now let me quickly explain to you what is meant by... by um, What's the word? Continental drift. Continental drift. Today, you can very accurately measure with GPS the tempo at which South America and Africa, for instance, are moving away from each other. Let's say it's 10 centimeters every year. Very accurately. Proper science. We don't have a problem with that. The thing is, what these people do is they say, all right, we know it moves 10 centimeters each year. So now it's very easy. We just measure the distance from this point to that point, and we divide it by 10 centimeters, and then we will know when these continents were together. So they make the calculation 10,000 kilometers divided by 10 centimeters. They get an answer like 100 million, 100 million years ago, these continents separated from each other. Right. Does it make sense? No, it doesn't. They assume that the current rate has always been carrying on since it started. That is not good science. That is purely speculation, guessing. You can't say that. Proper science has to do with observations in the present. You had to sit there from the beginning with your measuring tape for 100 million years and measure every day to be accurately sure of your date, of your time. You can't do that. So the best um, idea currently is uh, catastrophic plate tectonics. It's by one of our guys, creationists. The secular scientists admit that this is currently the best theory, hypothesis that there is. Okay, this guy's a Christian, he's a creationist, but wow, he's just got the best idea. He came up with his idea by making use of supercomputers. And what his model basically says is he uses Noah's flood as the, the catastrophic event that ruptured all these continents. And then by means of geological terms, I'm not a geologist, but by magma displacement and I don't know all these technical terms, those continents actually within the year of the flood moved rapidly away from each other to where they are more or less situated today. So the movement that you see still today is literally like the last state tracking, you know, of the flood, still wiggling a bit around and so forth. But he said within the Noah's flood, his model showed those continents moved rapidly away from each other. That's why India broke off from Africa and it ran so fast into Asia that it formed the Himalayas very, very quickly, actually. So the Himalayas are still getting taller, like a centimeter, two centimeters each year. But back in the beginning, it just rapidly that the Himalayas uh, quickly formed. So that's how the continents got to where they were. Now it comes to the Ice Age to uh, explain like animal dispersal. Dispersal? Dispersal. That word? Right, Ice Age. Let's have a look at the Ice Age. Now the world scientists, they tell us there were multiple Ice Ages. We believe there were only one Ice Age. And again, the thing that, that uh, kick-started the Ice Age were Noah's flood. It says in Genesis... Well, it'll appear there quickly. Genesis 7 verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And then the rest of the verse says, And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So the primary source for water came from under the earth. And for 150 days, it squirted out water from under the earth. It says in the Bible, after 150 days, God stopped that water coming out. And then two months later, the ark, stranded on Ararat, the mountains, and then five months later, they got off the ark. So they were on the ark for a little bit more than a year. So these fountains squirted out all this water. Uh, and then there's one of the Psalms. It says, after the flood, the mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place which you appointed to them. So after the flood, God just lifted the continents above the water level, and he made the canyon so deep that he could fill it with water. We know that the Mariana Trench is the biggest canyon in the oceans, 11 kilometers deep. So you can literally throw Everest in there and it will not stick out. That is how deep the world's oceans are. So now you sit with this picture. At the bottom, you sit with a warm ocean. This is after the flood. 
all that thermal water that came from under the water, this volcanic eruptions that occurred. So the water is warm, the oceans are warm, lots of evaporation. But in the atmosphere, all that volcanic ash is going to block out the sun. And it cannot shine through onto the earth. So the continents that are above the water will be cold. And when that um, precipitation occurs above these cold continents, it will form fall in the form of snow and ice. So now your ice will start to build up on these continents, exposed continents, and they'll get higher and higher. higher. So your water level will decrease because water comes back as ice and snow. So we believe that about a third of the world's um, continent, the, the uh, surface area, were covered with snow and ice, but further south, in the north, and higher up here from the bottom. And it's very interesting, the first time that snow and ice and frozen oceans are being referred to in the ocean, you find in which book of the Bible? The oldest book in the Bible, probably. It's the book of Job, and he lived a few hundred years after the flood. Look at this. He wrote that, from the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. And then in Job 38, he says, From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. So the surface of the oceans are frozen. So we think that Job experienced the ice age. According to our models, it seems like the ice, uh, a, ice age reached its maximum after 500 years, and in 200 years it came to an end. So after 500 years at its maximum, the ocean levels would have been at its lowest. So now you have land bridges. So animals can literally walk from one continent to the other continent. Even the secular scientists admit that people walked across um, Russia, and then they went through the Bering Strait into Alaska, North America, and they walked over a land bridge. Even the secular scientists say that the, the water levels were lower. So that's just how the animals and the people got to the different places, you know, the aborigines to Australia. And then after the ice age reached its maximum, the ash in the atmosphere started to clear. The sun could shine through better. So the continents were warm. And of course, now all the ice and the snow melted. It ran down into the oceans and the water levels raised again. And that is basically what we have still today. But there is a whole chapter, chapter 11, what is continental drift all about? And then a whole chapter on the ice age that will go a bit more in depth for that. But I can carry on for millions of years, but I think we should <laughs> cut it short. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for your time. And uh, certainly you gave us a huge amount of information. And uh, this, you will have the opportunity now to go and have a look at those resources. And hopefully you'll be able to purchase those as well. Shall we just close in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for information. We thank you that we can trust you, trust your word. We can trust not only the word uh, about the present and the future, but also about what you did in the past. And we pray that you will help us to, to spend time in studying, in learning about these things so that we can answer to those who don't believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.